This is the final learning outcome and it's basically everything that you get in your 20 mark questions. The overall main objective is to understand the effects of the media on the audience. And that's what we're going to look at first. So a lot of people say that the media has a profound effect on behaviour, ideas and morals of the audience. And a lot of people say that kids are violent due to violent video games. It helps if you understand a little bit of the evidence, so actual media products that have been blamed or that are involved in the effects of the media debate. So you need to be able to debate both sides of the argument. In order to do that, you need some real life examples. So a lot of people say there's a direct correlation between what's seen in movies and video games and what happens in real life. First thing is Natural Born Killers is one of the most famous films that is blamed for violence in real life. So there's a real famous case in 95 where two teenage lovers, Ben Barris and Sarah Edmondson, basically came across a businessman, shot him twice in the head with a 38 caliber revolver. And one of the reasons why Natural Born Killers was blamed is it was the exact same gun that was used in the film. It was also a man and his girlfriend who, who uh, actually did it in the film. And then they went on a little bit of a rampage. So then they gunned down a convenience store clerk. She got paralyzed and they went round trying to harm more people before they got caught. So the one difference here, or the one kind of argument against it is the fact that they were on drugs. So a lot of the stuff they had been doing was dropping acid while they were watching the film. So they watched the film over and over again, but then were drug fueled when they went down to copy it. So just within the eight years after its release of Natural Born Killers, the actual film had been linked to at least eight murders, including one Texan kid who decapitated his classmate because he wanted to be famous like Natural Born Killers. There was also some Paris students who killed three policemen and a taxi driver and they had the film's poster on the wall, so they were said to be fans of the film. The film Rambo was blamed for a famous English case, which is the Hungerford Massacre. And obviously there's less cases of violence in the media in England, because, especially gun related, because it's less easy to access guns. Now in this particular one, we've got a few different news stories that you can look at, and a few videos that you can watch from the real life news from that time. And the reason why it was blamed for it is generally because he did similar behaviour where he kind of lost the plot a little bit, armed himself up and went into kind of hiding, where, uh, killing people along the way. The Queen of the Damned was blamed for one particular guy who stabbed his best friend, stabbed him to death, drank his blood and ate his head. And one of the reasons why is he said that he was being told to murder people. And if he did, then this Queen of the Damned would make him into a vampire. Nightmare on Elm Street, a paranoid schizophrenic, which is the kind of argument against it, is did he only do it because he was mentally ill? He went round with knives between his fingers to kind of have like a Freddy Krueger effect and copy the Nightmare on Elm Street. So essentially what you have to do for this learning outcome and for all the 20 mark questions is you have to discuss the effects debate. Sometimes they link that to regulatory bodies and what, what would be the impact if there were no certificates, if there was no censorship at all, what would be the impact? And one of the things you've got to do is debate both sides of the argument. So regardless of your own personal opinion, you need to discuss both sides. So you need to say, yes, there is an effect of the media and no, there isn't, and put both kind of arguments across. It's so often called the media effects debate, and it generally links to behavior, attitudes, and values. Often it's just down to violence, but it can be people's attitudes and ideologies as well. For example, you could throw things like body imaging, where people seeing airbrushed photographs and things on Instagram all the time. That can affect people's attitudes and behaviour. It's not just violence. She's got some more examples here from games and music and movies. 
You've got the Washington Navy Yard shooting, which GTA was blamed for because it has a very similar level to what you went and did. You've got the James Bulger case where child's play was blamed and they watched some sort of torture scene in the film and then tried to reenact it on poor James Bulger. And then you've got the Columbine High School massacre, which the music of Marilyn Manson was blamed as well as Doom, the computer game. So here's a list of some of the real cave studies. We could talk about the Hungerford Massacre with Rambo, James Bulger for Child's Play 3, the Natural Born Killers cases, you've got the Columbine High School shooting where it was Doom and Marilyn Manson's music. You have since then had games banned, Manhunt game banned, Hatred game banned because they're blaming these violent video games for the violence that is occurring in real life. Sometimes it might not just be violence, but it's the ideology, it's the things that you witness and it could have an impact. So you could start bringing your other sort of um, theories in, like Walter Lippmann's stereotypes. You could talk about how the portrayal of black people uh, being criminals and things, it makes people more likely to find a black dependent guilty, and that was from a real study. And also males who view movie scenes objectifying women are later more likely to believe that a date rape victim experienced pleasure and got what she wanted. So in other words, young men who are watching films with rape scenes and um, objectification of women and sexual things, they're more likely to believe that the lady got what she wanted instead of actually just being raped. So to start bringing some science and some theory into it, there is one particular theory that really strongly argues that the media does have an effect and it's called the hypodermic syringe model. It was coined by Vance Packard in 1957 and essentially it's saying that the media has the power to directly inject ideas into your head. And they showed that there was a direct correlation between the violence and antisocial behaviour in films and in games and violence in real life. So the model suggests that children and teenagers in particular are vulnerable to media content because they are still impressionable. Now I would pretty much agree with this and say that young children in particular are very, very impressionable. And if you show them content that is not suitable, they will pick up and copy it. So this is linked to what you call copycat behavior where children see things on TV and they go away and copy it. If you don't understand what direct correlation means, it means that when one thing increases, the other thing also increases. When it decreases, the other also decreases. So this is suggesting that violence in the media is directly correlated with gun and knife crime. Sometimes called passive audience theory. And we've talked about passive audiences in the past. But this is essentially um, saying that all audiences are susceptible to new ideas. So everybody is able to have ideas injected into their heads. And the main concerns of copycat effects that we talked about. And this particular experiment here is where young children were exposed to films and cartoons of a doll being attacked with a mallet. And when the child was left alone, they went away and copied that behavior and started hitting an inflatable doll with a mallet. Another passive audience theory and an argument for the media having an effect is Gerber and Gross, and it's called cultivation theory. Essentially what they said is that people will become desensitized. It is desensitization. So over time, the repetition of viewing violent acts allows those ideas and values to become normal. In other words, people are becoming immune to violence and things that they say on TV. There's another effect, not necessarily relating to violence, but some feminist sociologists, Dworkin and Morgan, suggested that there's a strong relationship between the consumption of pornography and sexual crime. So in other words, they're saying that people are susceptible to ideas that they see in pornography and then go and reenact them in real life. So then we have some arguments against it. And one of them is that audiences are not passive, they are active. 
So Gauntlet in 2004, he suggests that there are major problems with the hypodermic syringe and other media effects model in the sense that they treat all audiences the same and they disregard other psychological and sociological disorders. So in other words, people who are mentally ill could be susceptible, but a lot of people who are of sound mind are not going to be. Another argument against the media having an impact is Cumberbatch. He said that he looked at over 3,500 research studies into the effects of screen violence encompassing film, TV, video and computer games. And he concluded that there is still no conclusive evidence that violence in the media influences or changes people's behaviour. So that's a pretty powerful argument, isn't it? This is another argument against, which I particularly like. It's by Fezbach and Sanger, and they said that TV violence, um, or basically that media can be an outlet, a safe outlet for people's aggressive tendencies. And not even just aggressive, like if you think about pornography as well, that could actually help to reduce sexual crime in real life because people can act out their fantasies in the pornography. And then the same with computer games, they can play a game where they can run around and shoot people so that they don't do it in real life. So I think that's quite a powerful argument. They say that screen violence can actually provide a safe outlet for people's tendencies. So you might want to take some time to study this particular summary. This is where we've got some arguments on both sides. So if you just learn two for each side, that will be a lot easier for you. You need to know what, this, what the theory is and a brief outline of what it means. And then you do the same for both. So you're going to need to debate both sides. So you could use your theories to back you up. You could use your actual examples to back you up. And then you could argue the other side and use your theories and examples to back you up. You could also include the conclusion, which is basically that evidence suggests the media has a powerful persuasion, but often the negative effects are on children and those of poor mental health. So would the poor mental health cases have caused harm anyway, or is it the, literally the media that's caused them to snap? Also, children who are the most likely to be affected, they shouldn't be seeing that content anyway. So the parents are to blame or poor choices from the BBFC and Peggy. What that basically means is that the censorship means that children shouldn't be seeing this harmful content in the first place. So either the parents have allowed them to do it, or the BBFC have chosen the wrong certificate, which has happened in real life. So the next important thing to look at is moral panics. Now a moral panic is something coined by Stanley Cohen in 1972, and it essentially refers to the way the media reacts to particular stories. Sometimes the reporting creates anxiety or panic amongst the general population. However, the media concern is usually well out of proportion to any actual real threat to society. So essentially what it does is it amplifies the deviance by provoking more of the same opinion. In other words, people see it on the news, believe it to be true, and their kind of opinion spreads like wildfire. There are some really famous examples of moral panics, but we're going to look at some specifically for the media. So the media will have you think that video games and rap music and heavy metal music and violent movies are to blame for people's behaviour. So they will blame high school students in America for going around and killing their classmates. They will blame video games for it. Now what seems more logical is that the media are basically running a moral panic. They're making people amplify in the situation. They're think making them think that video games are to blame, when in actual fact, if they look at the facts, it's a lot more logical to look at other kind of causes. So is it more likely that listening to that Marilyn Manson music made them go and get guns and kill all other people in the school? Or is it more likely that, you know, the students were alienated by other people in the school, that they were kind of, you know, generally desensitized by a lot of different violent, violent images and stuff when they were children. They've disregarded all of their family growing up. 
their home life, everything. The fact that people can get guns really, really easily. They disregarded all of that and just said Marilyn Manson's to blame. So that, in, in essence, is a moral panic. In 2012, there was a Sandy Hook shooting and multiple news outlets basically blamed that Adam Lanza had been obsessed with violent video games. And they just basically assumed it and created this big moral panic. And there were loads of different sources, supposedly close, saying he racked up thousands of hours on these shooter games. But actually, after an investigation, he actually spent most of his time playing Dance Dance Revolution. So I don't think that's going to make you want to go around and kill people. So Sandy Hook is a great example of a moral panic and where they're blaming video games without actually looking into the details. One thing that the exam board would like to do is to test your understanding of both of these learning outcomes. So you've got to understand the media effects debate, but also to understand the legal and regulatory issues as well. So you need to understand the censorship and who actually governs it. You need to know about self-regulation. So, you know, am I old enough to watch this? Should I be watching this content? And you need to know about copyright and intellectual property. So legislation is the written lawful policies that have been passed in Parliament to protect companies and individuals with regards to their data. First law that applies to media in general is the Copyright Designs and Patents Act. Now that is basically designed to protect your own property. It covers anything that someone's created, including songs, music, um, software, inventions, books, video games and films. It makes it illegal to copy or share anything without permission. Now the difference with intellectual property is, is if you work for an organisation, you essentially sign over your ownership of the creations that you've made. So the company owns them and not you. So if you ever leave the company while working on a product, it doesn't matter, you can't take your stuff with you, it belongs to them. Some of the regulatory bodies you need to be avail uh, aware of is ASA, Advertising Standards Agency. These basically take action to ban ads which are harmful or misleading, offensive or irresponsible in any way. So something that could offend the people or actually cause harm. They also make sure that um, they monitor ads to make sure they're following the rules and they're not falsely advertising to people. Ofcom is the Office of Communications. They're the UK's communications regulator. So they basically regulate TV, radio and video on demand sectors. So they are responsible for making sure everything is going according to plan and that people aren't being offended across the country. BBFC is a very important one for kind of censorship and the effects of the media. They're the British Board of Film Classification. Now that basically means that they give a certificate to all of the films when they come out. So essentially, they are the ones responsible for choosing whether it's a 12A, a 15 or an 18. And that is obviously vitally important to making sure people aren't offended. So PEGI is similar to the BBFC, but it's for computer games. They decide which age rating to give games. And again, they are vitally important because without it, you might get five-year-old children playing games with violence and sex and drugs and stuff in. IPSO are the organisation responsible for regulating newspapers and magazine industries and they essentially help to maintain freedom of expression for the press so they're allowed to kind of write freely but they also hold them accountable so they basically catch people out on the libel and slander. So censorship is a very important term and it's basically people deciding whether you should see something or not see it. And essentially, if you look at this debate um, website here, it's going to tell you all the goods and bads about censorship. Essentially, to summarise it, they stop people, they stop children in particular seeing harmful content that they shouldn't see. However, on the on the other side, it prevents people seeing things they are entitled to. So some people won't get to see things that they actually really want to, and there's no problem in them seeing it as well. 